Hello, I'm Sarah, and I've spent the past year in Nebraska learning about prairies and prairie conservation. Before I came here, I knew basically no prairie plant species, and that's saying something because there are hundreds in the tall grass prairie. If you're the average American sitting at home watching this, I would guess it would be a similar case for you. However, there are some plants that I would expect most everyone to know, and one of them is sunflowers. Sunflowers bloom in Nebraska in the late summer, and they show up in our prairies, in our wetlands, in our roadside ditches, and in our gardens. However, I learned about sunflowers long before coming to Nebraska. In fact, they were the star of many of my kindergarten drawings and paintings. If I were to guess, I would say that you've probably had a number of interactions with sunflowers as well. But how did we all get to know what sunflowers are? How did they get to be prevalent across so many landscapes in North America? How did we get to producing 50 million metric tons of sunflower seeds a year? And how did one of the most famous artists in the world, who lived in Europe, get to claiming it as his own? There's no one answer to these questions, but perhaps we can shed some light on them by looking at the reasons for their ecological success. This story starts long ago, and tracks how they spread across North America, becoming an integral part of the ecosystem. Then, after evolving alongside humans for a while, it tracks how they spread across the world. Sunflowers originated within the last few million years, with the best estimates landing around 3.6 million years ago. If you were to travel back to North America at that time, you would see some familiar animals like opossums, rodents, deer, and camels and horses. But you would also see mastodons, and giant ground sloths, and this thing, and this thing, and this thing. What you wouldn't see is any member of the genus Homo. That's because any humanoid species wouldn't appear on Earth for another one billion years. Preceding the origin of sunflowers, the climate in North America became cooler and drier. These shifts resulted in a reduction of closed forest habitat and an increase in open landscapes like grasslands and deserts. This left opportunities open for sun-loving species like sunflowers to come in and colonize the continent. It was under these conditions that Helianthus, the sunflower genus, split from its sister group, Phebanthus, the false sunflower genus. As sunflowers evolved in these dry, open landscapes, these landscapes likely selected for the large flower head that we're so familiar with today. An open landscape means that sunflowers can stand out among other plants, with their large flower head acting like a beacon for pollinators from all around. This might be a particularly effective strategy in dry environments, which can have fewer pollinators. Sunflowers continued to evolve through the Ice Age, or Pleistocene, and its many glacial and interglacial cycles. These cycles are thought to be important in the diversification of sunflowers. As the glaciers approached and receded, it would cause vegetation shifts that would bring populations of sunflowers in and out of contact with each other over and over again. If a population of the same species were divided by glaciers, they could become reproductively isolated from one another and slowly diverge into new species and their new areas. If populations of two different species were brought together, they could sometimes create new hybrid species through a quirk of fate and some genetic mutation. Hybridization causes a new species within one generation, so it's thought that this really boosted the number of sunflower species. Regardless, there is a big increase in species at this time, and this helped them extend their range across North America, finding new niches and expanding their influence. As sunflowers morphed in and out of habitats, they had a few strategies that helped them get a leg up on their competition. As all plants are stationary individuals, they have to get crafty with how they attract and repel other organisms. Sunflowers do this by being full of defensive compounds that inhibit the growth of other plant species. These allelopathic compounds can be leached directly into the soil or washed by rain onto plants nearby from their leaves and stems. This doesn't seem to have a big effect on grasses, but if other flowering plants come into contact with them, their growth can be inhibited. So, this brings us up to the present, where after 3.6 million years or so, sunflowers emerge as a successful plant species, 
with 50 some species being located all across North America. As I've worked with grasslands, it's become apparent that sunflowers are an integral part of the food web. They are so good at providing food and habitat for other species that they can be seen as a kind of inn for the weary travelers of the prairie. Their large petals and robust architecture invites passers-by in and tells them to stay for a while. When sunflowers are in bloom, you can see bees sipping nectar, leaf beetles eating pollen, and jumping spiders eating some of the other guests. You can also see many butterflies, crickets, grasshoppers, katydids, and others. A few of them decide to really make themselves at home. The silphium weevil is here for more than a mere snack. It's found its place where it's going to continue its gene pool. But what's the fun of doing this on an intact sunflower? No fun, apparently, because these daredevils decide to nearly decapitate the sunflower and then mate and lay eggs in the flower head. This ends up being a pretty good strategy for them because the flower heads eventually fall to the ground where the silphium weevil larvae hatch, eat the flower, and burrow into the ground. While it may work for the silphium weevil, I'm just gonna put a word of caution out there and say if you're staying with someone, don't decapitate them. The value of sunflowers as a food and habitat source is compounded by the fact that there can be multiple sunflower species within one site. As all species have their preferences for where they want to grow, this means that sunflowers can occupy a larger portion of a landscape and thus provide more resources. A multiple species site is also more resilient. If one species is oppressed by diseases, disturbances, or a flood of insects, then the other species can fill in and help maintain ecological balance while the other is gone. So sunflowers, with their diversity and abundant resources, really support the viability of many natural areas and all the species in them, including us humans. Humans and sunflowers interacting is a relatively recent change in the world. 200,000 years ago, while sunflowers had already been here for the past 3 million years, something else was happening clear across the globe. Homo sapiens had evolved in East Africa, but it would take another 180,000 years for them to get here and start interacting with sunflowers. That's about 0.6% of sunflowers' lives. Based on those numbers, if you were to live to be 100 years old, that's the same as somebody coming into your life for the last seven months. As with most plant groups, humans have had an outsized effect on sunflowers. For one thing, indigenous people have been burning for millennia. This altered the landscape in North America and cleared woody species and promoted herbaceous species like sunflowers. Indigenous peoples also altered the course of sunflowers when they cultivated it as a crop. This resulted in a single stem plant with a large head and sunflower seeds that are 10 times as large as its wild counterpart. Evidence suggests that there is only one origin of domestication, which occurred in the Colorado Plateau. From there, seeds were dispersed between groups who took them with them and planted them as they moved. This benefited people who obtained a food source and the plants who increased their range. Some of the first Spaniards to make contact with indigenous peoples took domesticated seeds home with them in the 16th century. From there, they traveled hand to hand and made their way to Russia. There's a reason I call out Russia, and that's because Russia is the first place to grow sunflowers on an industrial scale. But the reason why is a bit of a fluke and has to do with the Russian Orthodox Church. The church put out a list of foods that they banned during Lent and included a lot of oil and fats, but they failed to put sunflower oil on this because it was such a new crop. Subsequently, demand for sunflower oil boomed and hundreds of thousands of acres were planted all across Russia. These cultivars then traveled back across Europe and made their homecoming to North America in the 20th century. So the crop is just one of many species all thriving in North America today. They stand next to their wild counterparts, all dating back to the same ancestor. As sunflowers continue their evolution, they will continue to be a part of ours. We will continue to use them in old ways, like eating sunflower seeds, and new ways, like using them to absorb radioactive substances on nuclear accident sites. They will continue to support us, the environment, and hopefully be the inspiration for many more kindergarten artists, and maybe a few more famous ones too. In the end, I think that sunflowers belong to all of us.
humans and sylphium weevils alike.